All right, let's get this started. So, welcome to this talk. Let's get the formalities out of the way quickly. So, my name is Klaus Siegelberger. Doing a couple of C++ trainings uh, pretty much everywhere where I go. And I have the honor to talk about the singleton pattern. And of course, you know how these conferences work. Um, so, this, this talk was actually scheduled for the very end of this conference. And at these conferences, from the very beginning to the very end, with every session, with every talk, the tension, the excitement rises. Yeah, Till at the very end, you would have a talk about a very, very um, controversial topic, and this probably would not work well. So, they decided to actually move this talk to the middle of the conference. And so, in other words, we're going to have a lot of fun afterwards. All right. Um, so, let's talk about Singleton, and um, not just about it's a bad thing, it's an anti-pattern, but I'm asking the question, is there actually some good Singletons out there? So, is this sometimes, perhaps, truly a solution? That's going to um, be what we are talking about. But, in order to truly make this a controversial talk, I'm actually starting with a claim. A claim that I believe will be controversial, the singleton pattern is not a design pattern. And I'll repeat that to let it sink in. The singleton pattern is not a design pattern. Okay. Now, I believe there's three kinds of people in this room. First, there's the people that say single what? Okay. No worries. I'll be back with you in approximately 30 seconds. Then there is the people that nod looking sadly and say, yeah, of course, I've known all along, <laughs> it's nothing new. And as a third kind of people, it says, what? That's nonsense. After all, this is a pattern that has been created in the book on design patterns. <laughs> design patterns, well, it says it right here. And indeed, this is the book where this pattern originates. Not really, these guys collected them, so there was some code out before. But this book is indeed the origin of 23 design patterns. Probably the most well-knowns. Uh, um, pretty much every design pattern used is described in here. However, let's take a look at Singleton. So this is the intent of the single pattern according to the Gang of Four, the authors of this book. Ensure a class has only one instance and provide a global point of access to it. All right, this is what this pattern is supposed to do. And this is the UML diagram that I give to you. So what you have is an instance function. So some function that uh, allows you to access the one and truly the one instance that exists. And usually this instance is realized by some static inside the class. Recall this is a book from 1994. This is not exactly what we do today. But most importantly, there is this one instance function of extrude. This is that you can get the one and one instance. And today, we would probably not implement it in this form. The most common form used today is the so-called Myers Singleton. So this is an example of some database class. Um, yes, the instance function. And this instance function contains a local object. So a static database, the one thing that needs to be created. And the good thing about this Myers Singleton is that uh, this thing is initialized properly, and in C++11, even in a thread-safe way. And also, most importantly, in contrast to the examples in the Gang of Four book, it is properly destroyed. At the very end of your, of your program, the at exit function will take care of that. Nice. Else, of course, there is the usual um, write, read, and other things, you know, what you can do with the database, and imagine there's a couple of more things. But everything that you could use to create another instance, any kind of constructor, copy constructor, default constructor, all of this stuff is not available. So truly the only instance that you can get is with the instance function. And that's it. That's the one thing. All right. So why isn't that a design pattern? After all, it, it's a pattern. It's something that you find in a lot of code bases. Well, that's not my definition. You might differ, but I believe this is actually a pretty strong uh, point. So a design pattern, first of all, has a name. Now, if I say singleton, I communicate the intent of this design pattern. So, every design pattern has a name, every design pattern has an intent. Also, design patterns always try reducing dependencies. They usually address managing dependencies in some way. 
And they do that by introducing some sort of abstraction, something that uh, actually allows you to manage dependencies. And design patterns have proven to work over the years. So if you today invent something, it's not necessarily a pattern. It might become, but only if in many code bases the same approach has worked. So design patterns um, usually are used in a lot of places. All right, if this is the definition, then um, let's take a look at a real design pattern. Another one from the Gang of Four, the strategy design pattern. I believe one of the most well-known design patterns in the book. This is the intent. Define a family of algorithms, encapsulate each one, and make them interchangeable. Strategy lets the algorithm vary independently from clients that use it. So, and this is what um, such a strategy might look like. Imagine we have an employee registry, some class that actually stores a lot of um, employees, but at some point it wants to export some data. All right? So this is essentially the intent of export data. We have to write it. But how? In which format? There's many ways we could do this. We could do this in JSON. We could do this in any other format. But most importantly, we do not want to depend on that. We do not depend on a specific way to export things. So note, by the way, that this employee registry is not some base class. It's a concrete class, something that truly implements export data, needs to implement that, and therefore would usually depend on these implementation details. So we do not want to depend on the details, and therefore we isolate them. We isolate them by introducing some abstraction. And that may be my export strategy. So the name, of course, you can choose whatever you want to, but it suggests that it's about exporting and it uh, suggests that it's about the strategy design pattern. So this export strategy is now an abstraction. Cannot do anything right now. It's a pure virtual function, but this can now be implemented in many ways. But most importantly, we have now indeed extracted something. We've isolated the implementation details. We no longer depend on them, and this is an example for the single responsibility principle. Now, we do not want to depend on these details, so we isolate them. And as soon as we've done that, suddenly things are much simpler. We can, at any point, introduce new implementations, like the JSON strategy that actually does that by means of JSON. You can imagine so many other file, um, file strategies, so there may be more. We could also, just for testing purposes, introduce a test strategy. So, we are suddenly free to implement this as we want, but um, employee registry doesn't have to know about that. The fact that we can now actually implement uh, these freely, this is what we usually refer to as the open-close principle. We don't have to touch anything anymore. We don't have to modify existing code. What we have to do is to introduce a new strategy. However, why is this now a design pattern? Well, most importantly, because I can draw a line. I can draw a line that separates the using code that should know about the details and the details. So I can draw something that I would call an architectural boundary. And that is the decisive thing about a design pattern. You can actually separate things. And you can customize things on one side while the other side is totally unaffected. All right. So let's keep this in mind. This might be useful for later. But let's actually return to Singleton. So this is the UML diagram that you've seen before. And well, Singleton definitely has a name, pretty famous name, some would say infamous. It definitely has an intent, we've seen it, and although you might disagree, Singleton has proven to work over the years, somewhat. But Singleton is not aimed at reducing dependencies at all. On the contrary, as we'll see in, in a bit, this pattern actually in increases dependencies quite heavily, so it's actually, indeed, from that perspective, like an anti-pattern. And it definitely does not provide any sort of abstraction. There's nothing that you can do to change things. There's nothing that you can do to implement your own uh, details. That's not a design pattern. It really isn't. Therefore, I would argue, yeah, it's the origin of patterns, but it's only 22, and there's one implementation pattern. An implementa implementation pattern is the term I use to say, this is how uh, it concerned with implementation details indeed. You want to make sure that there's only one 
but this has nothing to do with managing dependencies. It has nothing to do with a bigger picture. All right, so with this out of the way, we can actually talk about Singleton. And indeed, there's a reason why this is a, um, a controversial talk. There is a lot of problems with singletons, no question here. And I believe the first problem that we definitely have to talk about is um, that singles represent global state, something that is available everywhere. And this is a bad idea. And so as, as Michael Feathers uh, actually said this in his book, Working Effectively with Legacy like Code, the singleton pattern is one of the mechanisms people use to make global variables. In general, global variables are a bad idea for a couple of reasons. So indeed, for a couple of reasons. It's not just one, there is a lot of reasons why this is a bad idea. First, because they represent mutable state. A mutable state on a global level means that, well, anybody can read and anybody can write at any point in your program. And it is super difficult, if not impossible, to actually control these accesses. Anybody can do whatever he or she wants at any point. And this is, of course, especially hurtful in a multi-thread environment. <laughs> this uh, usually is the reason why it is considered to be an anti-pattern. However, they're also very hard to reason about, simply because you have no control over them. So um, it is indeed something that you should avoid. Uh, if you cannot reason about your program, about whether it's correct or not, if you cannot reason about the state, it's hard. And something I will not go into detail, but it's something that I should at least mention. There's also problems with initialization. So you might depending on how you do things, run into the so-called static initialization order fiasco. If there is many singles, and in the worst case, even depend on each other. So it just isn't a good idea. And so global spread, okay? Guy, do you agree? <laughs> All right, so I, I, the yes was enough. We didn't practice. So global spread, indeed, but but if this is the, the, this is the usual statement, avoid globals, but this always leaves open questions. And this is also what I have to deal with in my training classes. Because there are some intrinsically global aspects, like memory. Memory is something that is global, available for everyone. Everybody can read and write. And it is something that you cannot suddenly make local. You can just try things, but you still have to work with this globally available memory. There's also time. It's also some like, something like a global resource. There may be something like a system-wide configuration, used in many, many code bases indeed. You set these things and you need them everywhere. You need them only once, so it's, it's the one thing that you have. And loggers. So usually people approach me and ask, is a logger now a bad thing? Can I not do logging? I only need the one. Okay, and you may have a couple of more ideas. The logger. Is this now a bad idea to have logging or not? So, I did some research, and in 2008, Isco um, Hebri actually uh, blocked, blocked a lot about singletons. And one of the things that he realized in all his blogs and all the discussions is this one. Singletons, which are semi-acceptable, are those which don't affect the execution of your code. Logging is a perfect example. The information here flows one way from your application into the logger. Even though loggers are global state, loggers are acceptable. I kind of agree. Indeed, there's nothing harmful about writing and writing from everywhere, but writing in a controlled way. You cannot read and write. You can only write. And so loggers indeed seem to be acceptable. Or to generalize it, based on what he said, singles with unidirectional data flow are acceptable. It may include some global configuration that you, um, that you have in your system, as long as you can only read. So, read and write. Oops. Yeah, if you separate this, this might actually work quite nicely. This actually reminds me about a discussion that we usually have in the community, and that's a discussion about shared pointer. Yeah, by now, luckily, people actually agree that shared pointer is not a particularly great idea. 
because it represents global state. Anybody can read and write this T at any point. It's, it's kind of hard to manage, it's hard to control. But you also agree that a single cons actually makes the difference. Suddenly you can only read. And that is perfect. So now I may have shared state, but as long as I can only read, this is not a big problem in the global code base. So um, this is acceptable. And so perhaps there is a couple of singletons that from that perspective are okay. But again, um, there is another problem that I would consider as much, much bigger. Much bigger indeed. Um, because this is usually the thing that makes the uh, code bases collapse under the weight of very often several singletons. And that is that singletons create dependencies. Very unfortunate dependencies, invisible dependencies. A code that uses some singleton inside is actually doing something that is not obvious in the interface. Yes, you use a singleton without seeing it, nobody sees it, and so, yeah, this is a problem. And you usually depend on concrete implementation details. If these details change, you have to change a lot of code. All the code that uses the singleton, and it's, it's kind of in secret. You don't even know exactly where these uses are. And there's artificial dependencies. So if the singleton is written in a way that is somehow depending on the implementation details, Imagine some kind of database that uses a specific form of database and therefore is implemented based on the, uh, on the restrictions there. And suddenly these dependencies, these, um, these vendor-specific details, are spread all across the code base. Changing that later is seriously problematic. So, altogether, this is just bad dependencies. And this is the real problem. Singletons impede changeability and testability. A lot. This is where people usually um, find themselves in a, in a problem zone. Changeability is important because this is what we do in software. So seriously, the word software comes from the fact that we want to change things. Uh, it's soft in comparison to hardware. So if you cannot change things, we do have a problem. Single to make it so much harder. And tests, oh my. Test that is not testable, uh, sorry, code that is not testable is just bad code by definition. And if you have a singleton in there that actually prohibits good testing, it's bad code by definition. And that's, that's a problem. So I think this is what we have to deal with. So yeah, sometimes singletons might be okay, but if these two things are broken, it doesn't work. So what do we do? So I now go back to my database example. Um, so the instance uh, function, you, you remember, um, this is the one function that creates a database, and we know that we cannot create another one. Now, this database is used in a bigger context. So imagine I have some widget, and I have a gadget, of course, and this is now two other classes would use this, this database. So this one reads, this one writes, and um, all of them depend on the database. All right. Now, the names, high level and low level. I know this is going to confuse a lot of you because it usually confuses everyone, but this is kind of what we find in an architecture literature. The high level is actually the thing that we consider to be stable. Yeah, I know. You might know it exactly the, the other way, but at least for this talk, let's assume high level means stable. This is the things that are not changing. Right? They, they uh, therefore have low dependencies. Low level, on the other hand, means this is the stuff that changes. It's volatile, it's malleable, high dependencies on, on many other things. All right. Now, I, as I know that high and low level is a little confusing, let's think about the standard library. The standard library itself would be in the high level. It's stable. It doesn't change. You can depend on that because it's stable. Uh, it's probably the most stable thing that we'll have. Yeah, this is what we make sure in the standardization. Things do not change and therefore um, high level. However, now the database visually is next to the thing that is most stable. Is the database, is the database truly stable? Is it truly something that you never change? Well, you might think so. 
But reality is different. In reality, things change. Perhaps not the STL, but definitely the database. Eventually, we're going to need a new one. So this is what we would like to have, but in reality, it's just the other way around. The database is an implementation detail. It's a concrete detail at the bottom of my architecture. It's the lowest level that you should have. But now, which and gadget solely depend on something on the lowest level. They depend on these implementation details. They suffer from any change that I do to the database. And therefore, this is not an architecture anymore. At best, I could say this is a broken architecture, but I would even argue it's not even an architecture. There is no architecture boundaries anymore. You cannot depend on the things that change. So this is broken. This doesn't work well. So how do we do things better? How do we actually implement a single such that there is no problem at all? And there is a couple of ideas. So, let, again, one quote from Isco Every. Appropriate use of global or semi-global states can greatly simplify the design of applications. So, the appropriate use. Let's talk about the appropriate use. How to implement things such that you do not have a dependency on all these details. Such that my database can very easily because nobody sees it anymore. So, let's talk about appropriate, but also always please assume that I now do this for the glo truly global aspects. It's not just for everything that you find um, is useful as a single, no, no. Still, it is global, so we restrict this to the things that we cannot solve in, it, in it, any other way. All right, and in order to show an example of an appropriate singleton, I actually go to the standard library. Indeed, there are singletons in the standard library. You might not have realized that before, but there is. So, this is an example from CPP reference. I modified it a little bit, but um, there's an array of, say, a thousand bytes, and this is the memory that I want to use for everything that I now do, for everything. So, no dynamic memory, I just want to use these 1,000 bytes. In order to make them useful for the containers that I'm going to use, I'm now creating a monotonic buffer resource. One of these C plus 17 allocators that just makes this byte available for memory allocations. So, we pass um, uh, raw data and we pass the size in order to make this known. Then, this allocator is actually given to a vector of strings. So I pass the address of buffer to the vector, and from now on, this vector will use this allocator to do allocations. And so if I am place a couple of strings, then for, with every memory request that is, uh, that is coming in, the vector will allocate from um, the mem uh, monitor buffer resource and eventually from the array. Interestingly, it's not just the vector, it's also the strings. The vector knows that these strings are of the same type in the sense of they're all from the PMR namespace. So it is passing on the allocator, and so also the strings will actually allocate via the monitor buffer resource. So in this entire program, not a single new is called. All the allocations go into the array, and it's enough. 1,000 bytes is, is just enough. Okay, fascinating story, you know. Back to Singleton. On the slide, there is actually a Singleton. The one thing that I didn't highlight yet, this function call here, std PMR null memory resource. Null memory resource is actually returning an allocator, an allocator that you know used to configure the monitor buffer resource. Because eventually you might run out of memory. So uh, 1,000 bytes is not a lot. And if you run out of memory, uh, then the monitor buffer, monitor buffer resource would use the null memory resource to acquire more memory. And the non-memory resource is the one allocated that doesn't allocate. Whenever you try to allocate, it throws an exception. Okay, so we truly just use this, this std array. But this is a singleton in a totally different form. But it is. And so let's take a look at the, um, the Gang of Four statement again. The intent of a singleton, ensure a class has only one instance and provide a global point of access to it. Elegantly, this is actually fully true. So this is now null memory resource from CPU reference. And this is the sentence that, we, um, that we're interested in. The same value is returned every time this function is called. So wherever you call this, whenever you call this, it's always the one allocator that you can get. 
So yes, you have a global point of access, the function. There is exactly one instance because it's always the same value. This is a singleton. Absolutely. So, in other words, this hides pretty well in here, and you do not care a lot about this. At least you might not. Still, this is a specific dependency on a specific allocator. If now do this or use this in code somewhere, you still have a very specific dependency on that one allocator. But you can actually change that quite elegantly by switching to a function called get default resource. Get default resource returns the system wide default allocator. True. If you don't anyth do anything right now, actually would use new and delete, but I can set the default resource globally. We are set a default resource. And this is where I now pass the null memory resource. And so globally, I now have static memory to, to get um, the memory, a, a global allocator. This idea is actually quite intriguing. You cannot get another um, allocator. You cannot get another w null memory resource. Because actually, you don't know which object you would have to create. Null memory resource returns not an object of specific type. It returns a pointer to base. And this is why I can put my own things in here. I have suddenly the ability to customize the system-wide allocator also by providing my own allocator. You can write an allocator in a few lines of code, provide it here globally. And this means that at this point, I actually inject the dependency on the allocator globally. Injecting dependencies. Injecting dependencies into something that needs an implementation detail. You might have seen this before. Oh yes, this is actually an example for the strategy design pattern. We're no longer depending on this particular um, implementation, but we can set this at some point and then from now on only use an abstraction. That is a strategy. And this is a real design pattern. Suddenly we start to take care of dependencies in the code. And this is the idea that we can use to actually make things work for us. So let's go back to our database example. Let's first identify the reason why this doesn't work. There's no abstraction. You always depend on this particular class, this one concrete class. So let's turn this around. Let's introduce some kind of abstraction. And I do this, for instance, by means of a persistence interface class. A good old base class with a couple of pure virtual functions. It's here in the private part. And yes, I admit, I threw in another design pattern, the template method design pattern, which we also know as the non-virtual interface idiom. So it is a base class with a virtual, a destructor, pure virtual functions, etc. And of course, all of the affordances, all of the operations that we need to actually use this persistence. So read, write, and a couple of more stuff. This is now the base class for, obviously, our database. Database is persistence interface. Implements all the functions that it needs to. But that, actually, we have an abstraction in place. Now, this abstraction um, wants to be set globally. And so we have a get persistence interface function. And we have a set persistence interface function that takes a pointer to a, a persistence interface. Uh, any, anyone. Also yours if you want to. The last thing we need is the thing that we keep in secret, the one true instance of this, uh, of this persistence system. This is the instance. This is not something that you share with others. This is somewhere hidden. Um, nobody knows that. The official interface is get and set. Now, this is implementation detail. Now, this is the th stuff that we need to implement. At some point, there's the definition of the instance. Okay. Get persistence returns this one instance, and set persistence, well, sets it. All right. But now, of course, we never want to return a null pointer. By default, it would actually be reasonable to use the database. By default, not necessarily for everyone, but uh, as a default, this is fine. But at the same time, we never want to create a database if it's not necessary. That would be bad too. So 
We just fill this with a little bit of code. We fill this with a static bool. So this bool uh, is totally artificial. <laughs> There's no other reason for that except for the fact that it is initialized only in the first, the first time we enter this function. So this bool is initialized only once, exactly once. Now, I initialize this with what is called an immediately invoked Lambda expression. It's a local function that I, function object that I call immediately. So note the, uh, the braces here. And this does the following. So it checks the instance. And if it is not set yet, then, and only then, only under this, in this case, we create a database and we actually set the instance. And return true. Okay, so whether we return true or false doesn't matter at all. This is a value that's never used. It's totally artificial. But um, we have now set the, the instance and we would return it. Okay. So, and now in secret, we've actually fixed our sync implementation completely. Now what we have in a high level is the persistence interface. Everything now depends on this interface. And it's an interface. It's not particular implementation details. It's just an interface abstraction. So which in Gadget are fine. Do you not experience any changes because of persistence interface? There's also the database up here. Still kind of in the high level because it's used, but in secret. Nobody knows about this fella anymore. No class, nowhere in the entire code depends on the database. It's a secret implementation detail. And you couldn't create a copy of it because you wouldn't know that it exists. And still, at any point, you are now able to introduce a, a custom persistent system. Something for testing purposes, something different than uh, the default. You are in charge to change things. And that ultimately gives you the power to control things yeah, for tests or any other situation. So in other words, this is now truly managing dependencies. This is now software design. By the way, this is what we usually refer to as dependency inversion. So suddenly, all the dependencies go upwards. Now it's a true architecture again. Before, it just wasn't. Now this works pretty well. So this kind of dependency inversion is definitely the first step um, towards an appropriate singleton. And you might achieve this, for instance, by means of the strategy design pattern. This dependence injection is just the right, um, the right thing to use here. And what called us an appropriate singleton, simply because user code no longer depends on one specific implementation. You have some freedom. Yeah, you have freedom to adapt. You can also test things more easily. You can customize at any point with whatever you have in mind. And yeah, as I just said, suddenly you can test things. You can test the code it uses a singleton, um, of course, as long as you know that it does use that singleton. And suddenly, it enables you to cope with intrinsically global aspects in a, in a reasonable way, uh, in a, um, an appropriate way. All right. So still, it's still global. As for the few global aspects, um, so. This is the one thing that you should always keep in the back of your mind. So in summary, the single pattern is not a design pattern. This is exactly why there are so many problems with it. It represents global state. This is why we have to be a little cautious. And um, so we should only use it for the truly global aspects. A few things that we just cannot handle differently. It should definitely be designed for change and testability because else it just does not work well, else it is an anti-pattern. And so you might throw in a strategy design pattern to make it useful. So it is definitely an anti-pattern if it is used naively. But it can actually be a solution if used appropriately. If things can be tested, if things can be changed, um, that is kind of the key for proper software design. All right. With this, I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much.